We're here today to share the stories of our Collegiate Mental Health Innovation Council members. CMIC is dedicated to finding and highlighting student leaders who filled gaps in traditional supports and services on their campus. Stay tuned to hear their stories and their programs in their own words. Hi everybody, I'm here with Olivia Lavarsky to talk about her awesome work in Maryland and at Towson University um, and just really excited to have had her as a member of the Collegiate Mental Health Innovation Council this year. So a little bit about Olivia, um, she's a rising senior on the Division I gymnastics team at Towson University. She's a major in business administration with a legal studies concentration and minoring in psychology. She just finished up um, serving as a fellow um, for the 2019 Governor's, Sum Governor's Summer Internship Program, where she worked on a statewide uh, initiative um, regarding the opioid crisis. And then she also is the founder of Own Your Roar, a, a really cool organization that's focused a lot on college athletics, but is dedicated to normalizing mental health conversations and treatment seeking and recovery. And she has a really cool new program that's built off of that. So I'll start it off by opening it up to Olivia to share with folks a little bit about your story and how you started Own Your Roar and got involved in this work. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, so I have been doing gymnastics pretty much all of my life, um, and I committed to um, do gymnastics at Towson a little bit before my junior year of high school. Um, pretty much from that moment on, I had this countdown on my phone that, you know, Towson was going to be the greatest four years of my life. And that's a lot of pressure to put on a place and an experience and everything else. Um, and coming from all the way from California to Maryland was quite the transition. Um, I was a bit overwhelmed at first by just the stressors that accompany the day-to-day -day life of a student athlete um, when you're waking up at you know, 5.30 to be in the training room at 6.15, practice 7 to 11, you know, then it's like, well, I hope that I can grab lunch or a shower or breathe before it's class and everything else and study hall and all of that. And um, I think a lot of times, you know, the demands of athletics um, and the life of a student athlete can be glorified a little bit um, and that it makes it really, really hard to accept when um, it doesn't go as planned. And, you know, the nature of the NCAA, the nature of sport conditions student athletes to withhold displays of weakness um, while they're balancing these stressors from an academic standpoint, athletic standpoint, and just overall. Um, so my freshman year, I think, during the transition, I um, began creating these expectations for myself that were perfectionistic and unrealistic. And when I didn't make them, I was really hard on myself. Um, I think that, you know, perfectionism paralyzes potential and the fear of failure um, made me not able to function at all. And so um, overcoming depression my freshman year, I learned to use athletics as my outlet. Um, I never thought that, you know, I thought that I, I knew that gymnastics would end at some point, but I never thought that, you know, working out and exercising would end for me. And so I, you know, I was like, oh, this is, this is a healthy outlet. This is a smart um, avenue for me to take. Um, well, I did, was out competitively my freshman year just because you're not going to put a mentally unstable girl up on a balance beam, which makes sense, but it was pretty tough. And um, about the last practice before I was supposed to compete for my first time in my college career, um, I ruptured my Achilles tumbling. And that's an injury that is pretty severe. Um, it pretty much knocks you on your butt for about 10 to 12 months, and there's no way of speeding that up. So um, one of the biggest takeaways that I had pretty immediately was the disconnect in the support and the treatment I received from um, everyone around me when I had, you know, when I was on the sidelines because I was um, struggling with depression versus when I was on the sidelines and I had this, you know, massive glaring injury um, that everyone could see the, the physical proof of that, you know, pain and the setback that accompanied it. So um, I think it was like uh, the day of surgery or like the day after surgery I had surgery in the morning and like that night I was on the phone with like some administration um, beginning some concrete planning um, of this initiative I was determined to enact um, called Own Your Roar um, definitely could have waited a few days I was probably like <laughs> under the influence of some painkillers but I was really excited and I knew that it was something that you know I was just determined to start um, because I do believe that you know mental health and showing that mental health is just as valid and just as, um, you know, it should be treated equally to physical health is of paramount importance. So um, that's a little bit about, you know, my background and 
you know, just I was inspired by my personal um, experiences and observations and tried to turn that into a platform for others. But That's awesome. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, really great to hear your story and all that you've learned and what, you know, I think the coolest part of being, one of the coolest parts of being in the mental health field is seeing how many people take their deepest pain and turn it into service to other people. And it sounds like that's, you know, exactly what, what you've done with your work and continue to do with your work. So it's really cool. Thank you. No, I definitely was very nervous to kind of share my story. And I just voiced, you know, my struggles to my teammates and to these administrators that I was talking to to implement on your roar. But um, I know when we were kind of finishing up the development stages and we were about to launch, um, Towson Athletics Media wanted to write a story about it. And their last question was, you know, have you had any experiences struggling yourself and would you want to talk about it? And I kind of like took a step back and I was like, you know, I'm not really sure. It's kind of, I mean, it's scary. There's obviously a big stigma attached to it. And I called my mom and she said, you know, the first step to destigmatizing it is to normalize it. She's like, I think, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I think that you've come a long way. I think you're strong enough to do it. And I did. And I was terrified. Um, but like the, impact that it had on you know my fellow student athletes or like anyone that kind of heard about on your roar was just incredible um and i actually shared um it, my story again in front of all the entire department at an event we did last fall um with we're all a little crazy and um i actually about two months ago i want to say um got a message from a men's golfer at towson who just said um, hey, you know, I wanted to, I just wanted to thank you ever since that night and ever since I heard your story, I started writing about mine. And he said, I was writing on and off for weeks, for months. He goes, well, last weekend I just, I sat down and decided to finish it. He goes, I'm publishing it on like a blog site next week. I just wanted to share it with you. And I just wanted to thank you. And I was just so overwhelmed because you don't realize the power of like your story and that conversations really do break barriers. Um, and so that was a very interesting cool experience um but yeah well so what I guess do you mind talking a little bit more about what it was like first starting to talk about your mental health because I know a lot of people want to be involved in mental health advocacy because of their lived experience but it's really scary to get started and and what was yeah. like was it hard especially when you're in athletics where it's you're part of a group, and now everyone knows something about you. What was it like? Um, what was it like before, and then what was it like kind of after you, you know, so, talked all about it? So I think, um, honestly, before, like, I almost wanted to kind of script it or anything, and, and you just can't. Um, it's just really tough. I think that often a lot of times people get kind of caught up in the idea that, like, oh, well, you know, I can't really say I was depressed because I wasn't suicidal or there's some sort of like qualification to fall under one of the categories of, you know, a mental illness. And I think that, you know, we all live on this mental health continuum where mental illness affects us all at one point in our life or another directly or indirectly that like just talking about, you know, whether it's situational or whatever um, can help just make it easier. Um, I know that the first time my story kind of became public, it was just through an article and so people were just reading it online through, like, TowsonTigers.com. And I think maybe, like, the afternoon it was published, I was walking through, like, Athletic Study Hall, and one of the advisors saw me, and he was like, Liv, what's up? He goes, you're depressed? Like, super loud, like, in front of, like, a lot of people. And he didn't mean it, you know, in a mean way, but he, I go, oh, yeah, like, you know, I've struggled. And he was like, I had no idea, and he, you know, kept talking to me, and he basically was saying, you know, I, I have so much respect for you. You always rock around, you know, with a smile on your face, happy to help people, everything else. He said, I had no idea, and um, I think that was really interesting, and then, you know, when I started to get emails or texts or, you know, social media messages from other student athletes at Towson or surrounding schools of the kids that their names were all over the headlines too, that was pretty cool because it was like, well, those people you would never expect either, but it just goes to show you that this affects all of us. And um, I think that um, – I lost what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but it's just – it's it really just comes down to conversations breaking barriers and um, 
there's no, you know, there's no qualification. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but it just helps if we can be open about it and, you know, help give and receive support. So. Yeah. yeah, well, so it sounds like from what I know, and if folks download and read the roar, we'll also know, um, and we'll attach that here, um, is that Own Your Roar really started out as a conversation opener and has since transformed even more to something that's going to have a heavier emphasis on mentorship. But um, do you mind giving an overview of Own Your Roar, what you've done so far, and then we can talk a little bit about where you're headed this semester? Absolutely. So I think we all know the power of social media. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to do when I created Own Your Roar was come up with a campaign promotional video. Um, we posted that, and I was super thrilled to see that, like, I think, like, inside the NCAA on Twitter retweeted it and shared that. So that went a long way, and that's part of, you know, how um, I got in contact with student athletes at JMU, at UCLA, and kind of helped them, um, had the honor of helping them create their own versions of Own Your Roar under their own, um, like, mascot slogan. So um, I think that was, that was great just to get started. Um, and after that, I started hosting these, like, forums. I, um, they were in, like, student athlete study hall because, um, you know, there's not a lot of time in our schedules and everything else, but um, just as a place to, for people to, like, give and receive support. Um, and some people were willing to, you know, just stand up there and share their stories, um, and others just wanted to learn more. But it became a really, really great, safe, open place for people to talk. Um, we tried to, you know, highlight topics like mindfulness and the, you know, the benefit in, like, guided breathing and meditation, um, and, you know, stress management tips, everything else. Um, we had one primary event where um, on the last day of classes, we called it the relaxation night, and it was just um, like two hours of different like relaxation methods. Um, so we had yoga, we had um, meditation. Two of my teammates at the time were art majors, so we did finger painting as like art therapy. Um, and all of these just fun activities to just kind of get out of your head a little bit and take a, take a break from studying before the final exam starts. Um, and that was a huge, like, those were huge successes. Um, and then, you know, using our platform in athletics, um, having those games, the football games, the lacrosse games, the baseball games, dedicated to mental health awareness and showing that, you know, yes, student athletes, we're tough, you know, physically, mentally, but, you know, we all struggle and we face a lot of stressors. And um, in sport, you're not really supposed to talk about it. And so kind of using that platform to, you know, use sport as the platform to talk about mental health and mental health awareness um, was had a really profound impact on not only just, like, our athletics um, department, but just, like, the surrounding community in general. So um, that was really cool. And then do you want me to, like, go into the programming? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess historically, um, you know, in the past year or so, we focused on increasing awareness and um, I think we've killed it on Towson's campus, um, and I kind of wanted to take it a step further. So I developed a trained mentorship program um, where student athletes from every sport will be participating. Um, there will be kind of two primary components, and the first is an educational seminar, kind of looping in the resource that we have on campus with the Counseling Center. And then um, the second being outside programming. Um, that's like leadership um, curriculum like tailored to athletics. So, you know, not only telling, giving students, athletes, um, the science behind mental illness, and that's something that, you know, I struggled with when I was suffering from depression myself. Um, I, you know, it took months of researching the science behind mental illness for me to believe that, you know, depression isn't something that you make up. And in sport and everything, it's like, oh, well, get out of your head, get out of your head. And sometimes it's just not like that. And so I do think it's really, really important that student athletes and students in general understand the science behind it. And I think that if you couple that curriculum with, you know, mindfulness, resilience, leadership training, and you're furthering it by instilling skills in them that they can take when they approach um, their tasks, their challenges, whether that's daily practice or an exam or whatever. So very, very excited. Um, we have some evaluation metrics in place to determine growth in well-being and self-efficacy, but overall just really grateful for the support of the Towson Athletics Department. That's awesome. Well, you kind of got at this question, but do you mind talking a little bit more about the language decisions and approach that you've taken specific to sports? So historically, from a lot of the research I've seen, and, I, you know, I was in athletics myself, 
there are certain environments where conversations about mental health um, can be even more challenging than they are regularly. So did you, can you talk a little bit about like a different angle that you maybe took um, compared to a traditional kind of just mental health awareness or information approach that made it fit better in athletics? Um, I definitely think kind of utilizing the platform of um, creating these mental health awareness games. Um, that was a huge um, success, I think. Um, and also just for me, I tried to relay the message that, like, hey, you know, we all go to the training room every single day to take care of our bodies physically so that we can practice and compete, you know, to, and excel. Why don't we do the same thing for our mental health? You know what I mean? Like, everyone, everyone is well aware that, you know, there's, you know, so much of the game is, is physical, but then there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and, you know, in, internally and in your mind. So why don't we, you know, paying attention to that when, it, when you know, it, the mental game is a huge component of sport. And so really just saying almost like, hey, you're, you go to the weight room and you strengthen your body, what are you doing to strengthen your mind if, if, you're, if you're admitting that, you know, sport is so much of a mental game as well? Um, so I think that that was a big part of it. Um, yeah. Very sense. Yeah, so framing it in the language that is constantly being used. Because um, mm -hmm. I think that does make a big difference. Is it's when, and you kind of spoke to this, when you're first struggling it, and you have no information about, and you don't have people to talk to and you, like, don't know what's happening and you're like, oh, you know, I've heard really horrible things about what it means to have depression or anxiety or, like, what that means about you as a person. And it's like, putting things in terms that people understand and can relate to mm -hmm. makes such a big difference to that gap. Yeah, I mean, I think looking, even looking back at my experience, um, when I was first struggling with depression, I wasn't even, you know, aware of it. I was really hesitant to, like, categorize it as depression, I think. Um, I finally, you know, it was weeks of me just not being myself and just not feeling okay. And I finally called my mom and said, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm struggling with depression, but, like, that sounds really dramatic. And she was like, well, you know, like, let's talk about it. And I did. And she was like, you know, I think you might be, and that's okay. You know, we'll figure it out. But for me, it was just always, you know, and, and I think especially elevated in, in athletics, it was just, oh, well, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm being dramatic. I'm being dramatic. And that was, I think, always the biggest thing because it's, like, it's the classic get out of your head. You know what I mean? It's, it's you know, if you're, you push through the pain, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, um, you know, gymnastics is a sport that you're judged on perfection every single day. I mean, um, I think even growing up physically, it was, you know, you're in skin tight leotard, you can't really hide anything. So that was created really, you know, big struggles with just body image in general. Um, and it's a sport that um, it's never ending in terms of difficulty. So, you know, you master that double flip, that double tuck, and then it's add a half twist, add a full twist. So it's that constant striving for perfection and also kind of knowing that that's not really attainable and then trying to be okay with that. And so that was really tough. And, um, you know, in the sport, it's a sport where fear is a huge um, barrier to growth um, because, you know, you somehow have to trust yourself to throw yourself backwards on a four-inch piece of wood on the beam, um, but it was always just, well, I'm tougher than that. I can't be dramatic. I need to get out of my head, and it's just not like that, and so shedding light on, well, hey, there's resources, and there's support out there beyond just, you know, your coach yelling at you to get out of your head um, is really, really, really important, and just promoting those, um, you know, but my whole goal with the mentorship program is being aware of the lack of, um, finan like, finances that pose as a barrier to increasing resources and instead utilizing, you know, the resources that we already have that are in place and saying, well, why don't we promote these peer relations as a way to increase support for mental health? Yeah, yeah no, that, that makes total sense. I think that's one of the biggest challenges people have is that, you know, if you might have counseling on campus, you might get referred off campus, but if your health insurance doesn't cover mental health services or if there's nobody in your area who takes insurance, that's such a huge financial burden. And I know mm -hmm. there's been a lot of talk within college athletics about, um, you know, schools giving or taking money or whatever. And I think that's probably yeah. additionally because you can't work, right? You, you yeah, are just, the demands of the schedule are 
Yeah, so to me, the, um, the schedule of a student athlete is pretty intense. And, um, you know, my freshman year, I did go to the counseling center, um, and I had a bit of a frustrating experience, um, personally. Um, you know, the counseling center at Towson, and I'm sure, you know, at every other school, is, is just as welcoming to student athletes as it is to any other student. Um, but, I, you know, I was referred to someone who didn't really have a background in sport, and one of the first things they said was, you know, why don't you quit? And for me, I was like, well, absolutely not. Like, this is my world. This is, you know, I grew up going to high school from 7 to 12 and then getting in the car and practice was from 2, two to 8. Like, I was in the gym six hours a day seeing my coaches sometimes more than my own parents for in a day. And so um, for that to be kind of the proposed solution, is I kind of think I got pretty mad. And I was like, well, no way. And, you know, the counselor was like, well, it's not making you happy. I was like, one thousand percent, you're right. But a lot of things aren't making me happy right now. And this, I promise you, is not the solution because you know if this is taken away from me, I, at you know at the time that was my identity. And you know I think one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is that there's more to life than gymnastics. There's more to life than sport, and especially in a sport that there's no professional gymnastics. It doesn't continue beyond college, really. Um, it's a harsh reality. And, I mean, even thinking as I'm embarking on my senior year that come April, there's no easing out of it. It's kind of like an abrupt stop because mm -hmm. um, just the demands of the sport, you know, you can go join a softball league when you're older and everything, but you really just can't do gymnastics past a certain point. Um, and if my body even makes it through this year. Um, but it's just, it's a lot. No, it sounds like your work yeah. <laughs> would be really good also for, athletes transitioning out of college too of having some Definitely. sort of support I've had, on that. I've had some I've had some really amazing conversations with alumni um and that have actually kind of reached out and said, you know, I wish that you know, why didn't some why wasn't this in place when I was there and everything else and how can I get involved? And so kind of trying to come up with some sort of alumni event with like a panel discussion, um, and just saying, you know, what can we do? And I actually had um the honor of talking to a former football player at Towson. Um who had said, you know, hey, my senior year um, in college, I had planned, you know, I thought I was maybe going to go pro. And he said, I, you know, I, I got hurt, a se like, season-ending injury. It was my senior year. Um, and he got, he got pretty much hooked on the painkillers they gave him after surgery for the next 12 years of his life. And, um, you know, now he is sober, you know, where, like, just has totally turned his life around. It's just an incredible story. But there's, there is – that lack of support, and especially when, you know, your world is athletics and life is student-athlete, there's not a lot of time to explore, you know, other opportunities, and sometimes your academic, like, opportunities can be compromised because of the demands of your schedule, and you don't have that chance to, like you said, like, you don't have the chance to work, or you don't have the chance to go to that extra conference, or that take that class that you maybe really want to, because it falls under practice schedule. And um, it's, you know, there, these are sacrifices that I've made that I'm, you know, grateful for my opportunity to be a collegiate gymnast. But um, it does come with a sacrifice, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. And um, going, at, you know, when you're training four hours a day or whatever, and then all of a sudden you graduate and you don't have that, it's like, well, what do you do with all your free time? And I didn't really have a chance to figure out what I wanted to do with my life during college because I didn't barely had time to sleep. And so um, I think... I had the um, chance to kind of converse with some people at the National Academies um, a few weeks ago, or a few months ago and just kind of talking about, well, the, you know, the, the relationship between academics and athletics in universities. And I was kind of pushing for, well, I think that we need to kind of interweave them a little bit more rather than trying to divorce them because, you know, let's get faculty more involved. And, you know, I definitely think, you know, when I'm looking at grad school and job opportunities after college that, you know, I probably have some great letters of rest from athletics administration and stuff, but my options for professors are kind of limited because I didn't have the chance to kind of really develop that relationship because I was exhausted. <laughs> and, I, you know, I had to race to the next class or I was racing to practice or whatever, um, that if you, you know, get more faculty involved in athletics and kind of interweave the two, then maybe, you know, we promote um, – more successful, you know, career paths and stuff for immediately after graduation for athletes. Now, do you see or have you um, experienced using Own Your Roar in more of an advocacy capacity? So, like, a space where you can talk, a space for people to connect, but also um, a place where 
students can come together and student athletes can come together and figure out things like this where you know you could advocate to the NCAA or to the university or to whomever um, that hey these are the things that impact our mental health and this is what we want and this is how you're doing it. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, it's been a really amazing, it's been really amazing to see student athletes come together around this. Um, and even, you know, when I struggle through depression, and you know, it comes, it comes, it goes in waves. I think that it's, it's so amazing to have so many student athletes right behind me saying, no, this is so important. You know what I mean? And um, I think definitely, you know, we use the platform of SAC, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, to address issues and concerns within the athletics department that I hope to see Own Your Roar kind of follow in that same footsteps and take it beyond Towson's campus. Awesome. Yeah, can you, I guess can you speak a little bit more about what you see for the future? Because it sounds like there's a lot of other schools who are very interested and it's a really huge need. Um, and the NCAA also probably some interest. Um, so what do you see as uh, the future of the organization and how that ties to your re your upcoming research and you know what you're hoping to do and create? Absolutely. So. Um, I've worked to con develop connections with um, some people in, in the NCAA, and so through finalizing the development of this program, um, I reached out to um, the Director of Academic Affairs and had a really, really great conversation with him, and basically just saying, you know, I've developed this program as a generalizable model for any institution to imitate, you know, regardless of the existing characteristics and resources that they may have on their own campus, um, and that I would love, you know, the opportunity to share and present. Um, and they were really, really interested, which was awesome. I think that um, through working this past summer um, in the Governor's Internship Program and with the Maryland Higher Education Commission, um, I kind of expressed to them, um, you know, in respect to the statewide opioid crisis and really nationwide, <laughs> um, that, you know, if we implement some sort of mental health campaign as like a best practice preventative measure, then you're helping these youth um, you know, give, giving them the tools to cope with their emotions, cope with stressors, cope with failure before they turn to using and, you know, abusing drugs. And so um, looking at, you know, seeing how this programming goes through the fall semester and what the research shows, um, I'm really hoping to push it through the state level and through the NCAA. That's awesome. And you, are you hoping to keep it, when it expands at the state level, um, still keeping it to athletics or... I definitely thought about expanding. Um, I think right now, I, I I don't know. I'm definitely the type of person that, you know, wants to help everyone. And um, I've talked to a lot of advisors who have said, you know, why don't you kind of keep it in athletics right now just mm -hmm. so that it's effective. And so, like, narrowing my scope for now. But um, I would love to expand it beyond athletics. Um, I just, you know, with respect to the demanding culture of sport and everything else, I think that, um, as much as it is starting to grow in, you know, conversations, um, I think there's still a significant uh, barrier. And yeah. so probably going to keep it for athletics for now. Yeah. Yeah. So would that go into the high school, like high school athletics too? Is that? The... I would, I would love to see that. I think that, you know, especially the, the initial transition going into your freshman year, like you said, and um, transitioning out of sports, but all through the recruiting process and everything else, I mean, in my, in my personal experience, I committed to Towson, um, like, in the beginning of my junior year of high school. And so all through that, you know, it would have been awesome if I had, you know, the tools to kind of, um, or just more emphasis on that, you know, some sort of external curriculum and, like, mental health education so that I was aware of, you know, myself setting these crazy, unrealistic expectations for myself and beating myself up when I wasn't attaining them. So, yeah, definitely. There's been research coming out about how intense it is to even participate in middle and high school sports now. It's just thousands of dollars. It's crazy. Everything's super elite focused. So I think even yeah. even students who, you know, maybe back in the day where it would have been this person kind of really stands out, whatever, now the competition seems way more intense where it's like all year round and all these coaches and I think oh yeah part of it's part of it's related to money right but it's also just like mm -hmm. more students are going to be dealing with the the issues that you're talking about 
Well, and it's that mindset that there's always more you can do, which that's, you know, at the middle school level. I, I mean, I started training for gymnastics. I started training six hours a day in middle school. And it's a, it's a harsh reality, but it's that, oh, I'm tough enough to handle this and everything else, and there's no other option if I want to be good, if I want to go to college, if I want to do gymnastics in college, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's incredibly tough. I think the recruiting is kind of crazy. Um, you know, my freshman year of high school, um, one of my teammates at the time committed to UCLA for a full scholarship to do gymnastics, like, four years from then. And it was like, well, you know, what if the girl had a huge growth spurt, decides she doesn't want to do gymnastics, and goes, plays, goes and starts to play volleyball her junior year? Like, that to me is like, oh, well, I, like, maybe at the time I probably didn't even know, like, what I was going to wear the next day. And it was like, well, and now I'm also going to commit to where I want to go to school in four years. And so it's it's huge, and it's a lot of pressure at such a young age, and it kind of starts that conditioning of that intensity of sport and everything. And, um, you know, I'm grateful for the discipline and for the resilience and everything that I've had to learn, but I think just giving a little bit more attention and showing that, you know, ups and downs are okay um, and using that as fuel to get stronger. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I guess the way that – we've been closing these um, on that line is if you were talking to a high school student who was doing athletics and was going to college or maybe you a younger version of you when you were first struggling and and looking to figure out what what this all means what are some words of wisdom you would give to um, give to that person I think something that um, uh, the director of sports benefit Towson told me um, about a year ago or so, um, that's really stood out to me is that um, perfectionism paralyzes potential. And knowing that, you know, using failure as a tool to grow and to, you know, learn is huge. I think that for me looking back, you know, failure was always just unacceptable. And you didn't talk about it. You avoided it at all costs. And learning that it's actually helpful and to kind of grow from that and everything else that, um you know, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Um, I think that, you know, I learning to compartmentalize your life and take things one thing, one thing at a time um, is just the way to go. But I just hope that, you know, through my work at Towson, through On Your Roar, um, and just utilizing my fortunate position as a student athlete, you know, I just hope that um, this campaign helps other students recognize that, you know, they're not alone, that they're capable, and they're worthy. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, and thanks for sharing all of your really cool work um, with everybody. For those who are listening, you'll be able to read more about Olivia, um, find out how to check out more about Own Your Roar, and contact her through the report that's going to be linked in this video. Um, and thanks for joining us. And have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>